We all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and it's time to get wealthy. You're going to learn exactly what you need to know and do to finally achieve the level of financial success you desire and you deserve. The fastest growing segment of new businesses is Black women. And yet, over $300 billion in VC capital was given in 2021, and yet only 2% of women received any of it, and only 1.7% of Black founders. So how do Black women get their fair share? Well, here today to share with us exactly what we need to do is someone who's made it her mission to create generational wealth for Black founders. But here are the three things you may not know about what it means to be a successful builder. First, know your value and your values. Build a board of advisors, and then know when to pivot. And here to share with us exactly what we need to know and do is Catherine Finney. She's the managing partner of Genius Guild, a $20 million venture fund. She's an amazing Black founder herself, and she has made it her business to help other Black founders find their path to generational wealth. She is also the author of Build the Damn Thing, and it is my pleasure to invite Catherine Finney to get wealthy. Thanks for, so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Hello, Catherine. Thanks so much for joining us. You know, I shared with you in your new, I was listening to your new book, Build the Damn Thing on audio, bursting out laughing because I felt like you were channeling all of my frustration <laughs> as I was trying to go out and uh, raise capital for an app that I wanted to build. So I would love for you to just start out. You're a serial entrepreneur. Why did you think it was important to write this book? Yeah, you know, I wrote Build the Damn Thing because it was the book I wish I had when I started. When I started way back in the stone ages of tech, I think my first company, I started building it in 2002, there was little to no advice for someone like me. Um, there's little to no advice for women. There's definitely no advice for anyone who was black who was building a startup in that world. And I had to figure out everything myself. No one was forthcoming with any information. So everything from how to, how to build it and scale, who to hire, how to get venture funding, even what is venture funding, right? What is venture capital? No one would willingly give me that information and I had to learn how to do it myself. And so I wrote this book so hopefully people don't have to start at zero, like me, that um, they're gonna be able to come into building their companies with quite a bit of information and then be able to take it to the next step. So it's almost like the, the cheat code <laughs> to building uh, a company um, as someone who's not a rich white guy. Love it. And so the framework for our, uh, the way we frame success on Get Wealthy is really through a framework of mindset, strategy, and execution. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I want to start with mindset. I know in your book, one of the things I found so interesting is that you kind of named things like you called the the folks, the you know, the rich white folks entitled, and it's sort of that you that was just so. What do I want to say? Uh, uh, just <laughs> insightful for me because so often you feel like you know, like why why aren't I getting ahead? And the point you make in the book really is is because you're a builder. You didn't come. You didn't get any like advantage you are not entitled so let's be clear on that so 
I, I had gotten so discouraged about uh, doing pitches. And so my first question to you is really around mindset. What is the mindset that you have to have as a black founder out here trying to raise money for your business? Yeah, you know, as a builder, we have to realize that we're not going to be given the same runway, the same uh, experience, the same help as others. And, you know, I always uh, like to quote my, my grandmother, it is what it is, right? Um, it is what it is. And so for us coming into building and knowing that, we have to employ a little bit of different strategies. And the first thing that we have to do is really get our mind right. That's the first step of the entire book. Um, and I talk quite a bit about getting yourself mentally prepared, um, kind of building that foundation so that you're able to deal with the challenges that you're going to deal with um, as you build. Being an entrepreneur, regardless of your race, your gender, your class, is hard. It's hard for everyone. But it's especially hard if you're not given that extra push. And I talk about the video game where some people start on different levels depending on your identity. So if you're starting on the hardest level and you're, and you're supposed to make it to the end, you're gonna need a lot of different tools. You're gonna need a lot of different armor. And so as a, as a startup founder, as an entrepreneur of color, it's first you know building your personal advisory board. I think that's one of the things that's helped me the most. And what I mean by that is, you know, for our companies, we have corporate advisory boards or we have business advisory boards of people who give us great business advice. The personal advisory board of the people who are in the business of you, you personally, and want to see you succeed. And so there's a couple of different roles. Um, as a person of color who comes from resource poor communities, um, I've had experiences where, you know, if there's an article that Catherine raised $10 million in Forbes and family members see it and then they, you know, call me and ask if I could, you know, help them buy, buy a refrigerator or whatever it may be, um, it can be really hard to say no. And so I have on my personal advisory board my mother who, you know, is a 75-year-old black grandma who loves to say no and no one's going to question and so she can say no for me when I can't say no to that particular family member without causing a particular challenge. Um, I have someone on my personal advisory board who brings laughter. Uh, when you're building a company, it can be lonely. It can be hard. It can be frustrating. And so having a little, a little of levity in your process, kind of where you can laugh and just release is so important. For me, that person is actually my son. Um, he, you know, is seven years old. He, he he's hilarious. Um, it's very hard to be mad at a portfolio company of mine that's not doing great if I have a seven-year-old, you know, singing a rap song about people who live in the toilet. It just puts everything in perspective. And then there's other members of your personal advisory board, the person who can tell you about yourself and you hear it. Um, sometimes as entrepreneurs, we get so excited about what we're doing. Um, and about the business and we don't hear the challenges with it. We don't, we can't see it because we're so committed and so into it. And so having someone on your personal advisory board that you can hear, right? They can tell you about yourself, right? And you can actually hear it because there's a lot of people who can tell you about yourself, but you may not want to listen to them. You need the person who you listen to, whose advice you trust, um, and who can give you the guidance and can tell you things and you can hear it. And so I think that's very, very important for us as we build, and particularly getting ourselves mentally prepared. And then also, and this is, I think, one of the most important things, is being comfortable with failure. And that's really hard when you come from communities where your success is the success of everyone else. I often talk about how we don't get to own our failures as black folks, like if I fail, it's not just Catherine Finney did bad, it's black women did bad, it's black women can't write, it's black people can't be in this space, you know, it's people from Chicago can't do it, what have you, we don't get to own our failure as our white male counterparts do. When Billy fails, it's just Billy failed. It's not all of the Billies in the world, it's not all the white men. And as a result, it can really create this space where we get really afraid to fail. Um, but that is a part of the process of winning. You cannot win if you have not failed. And um, in the book, I tell the story of Beyonce because I love Beyonce. And 
about how when she first, in the first version of Destiny's Child, um, they were on Star Search and she was 12 years old and they lost and they lost to a hair metal band. Like Beyonce lost a hair metal band. And how she could have been like, you know what, I'm done. I'm gonna go and just be like a regular kid. I, you know, we can't even beat these like hair metal band people. Um, but she didn't and she continued to work. And the first song that they had is Destiny's Child was no, 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 no. And a part of it was inspired by all the no's they got as they were building the, building their their singing group. So I share that to talk about how as communities we have to be comfortable with failure because that's on the path of success. And those are the things that I think are really important to getting yourself mentally ready to be in this space. Well, you know what, Catherine, it's interesting. One of the points that you make is that, you know, that bias is unconscious, bias, whether it's unconscious or otherwise, is real. And so your point that you make is just about uh, that if we're going, we need to build our own rules of funding and investing and certainly that's where I felt like I was at a certain point. And, mm -hmm. and so I started crowdfunding, you know, to, to, to get the money. What, uh, in, in terms of us really thinking about what are our avenues and, and one of the other points you make is that we need to act like we're entitled already, mm -hmm. you know, and to overcome things. What advice can you give us about venturing out and creating that funding source so we don't get discouraged and just, you know, kind of throw our idea to the to the side. One of the my favorite pieces of advice I got from a friend, her name is Cheryl Comsey. She's one of um, the first black woman to sell her company to a publicly traded company. And um, she always says, you know, go into the room and just, you know, pretend like you're a rich white guy. She's like, <laughs> like, and she said, and go into the room and realize that you are the coolest person they have met that day. They have met no one else more interesting than you that day. And this is so true when you're a woman, when you're a person of color, you go into the room, they spend all day looking at the same people and here you show up being fabulous, wearing whatever it is that we wear because you know how we do it. And you are the coolest person they met. You are the most interesting person they met, you are going to be the topic at dinner that night. And so walk into the room holding your head high as such and understanding that. And that piece of advice has served me so well, um, going into rooms, because it is what it is. This, this packaging is what it is. I cannot change being Black, nor will I ever change being Black, or being a woman. It is the identity that I walk through the world. So accept it. And I accept it and I love it, right? And so I come into spaces like that and it's so important for us to start to do that um, because we cannot change ourselves and diminishing ourselves does not serve anyone. It doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve the businesses we're trying to build. It doesn't serve our family. It definitely doesn't serve our community. So I think that's really important. As a result of that, when you walk in that way, you start to realize what types of, um, assets we have in our community. And I talk about this in the book. The assets we have in our community have been undermined, meaning in the tech space, these things that are, can help your business that comes uniquely from being a part of our communities is often not seen as a plus. So many of us may not have friends and family that can write us $50,000 checks. Um, as I say to people, I am the friend and family in my family. <laughs> like, I am that person. But could our families help us with PR? Could our families maybe work, you know, on a Saturday when we need a little extra help? In my case, when I was starting um, the social enterprise, I found it Digital Divided. I needed childcare help. I could not find great childcare and was frustrated and was a nervous wreck. Any of you who have ever had challenges with childcare, you know exactly what I mean. And I called my mom up. My mom was very much retired. She had been done raising her kids. And I said, I need help. And she's like, okay, I'll come. And I thought she was saying she was coming for a week or two. She ended up living with us for four years, the first four years of my son's life. And when I say, like, I can't even calculate how much money that would have been. So yeah, she didn't write me a 50K check for my company, 
but it would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars to get that level of care from someone who I knew loved dearly my son. And so I think for us, start to look at the assets our communities can give us that are not necessarily money. Um, many of us go to large churches, uh, asking the pastor if we can pitch our company, you know, during the announcements. Can we put something in the, the church announcements? Is there some other way? Can we put our books, for those of us who are authors, can we put our books in the church's bookstore? You know, all of these sort of things are assets we have in our community. Um, many of us are starting to turn to crowd equity platforms like Republic. Um, and others where it allows you to sell equity in your companies, but to other people besides people like myself or venture capitalists. So if we have communities um, that we're a part of, sororities, churches, community organizations, it can be a really effective way to raise money for our companies. And then those people become owners in our company. They have ownership. And then they also have a big um, sort of feather in our success. They, they will start to pitch you, they will start to promote you, because your success means their success as well. You, you, you've said a lot, and I think for so much of it, it really is mindset making a shift. But really, I think in your book, what you acknowledge is, girl, what is for real, right? It's for real, for real. You're not imagining things. And so no. when we come back, I want to, to uh, go to the next part of our framework, which is strategy. And I really feel like your book uh, really gives some very insightful, specific uh, tips on what uh, women need to, Black women specifically, Black founders need to do and people of color around getting their fair share and actually getting access to funding. So when we come back, folks, it's all about strategy. So don't go anywhere. I hope you're enjoying this conversation with Catherine Finney, who is sharing with us the strategies from her book, Build the Damn Thing. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. Let's be honest, as successful women, we're crushing it. Maxed out 401k and Roth IRA, check. Aggressive savings and investments, check. Yet. The freedom our success was supposed to buy can leave us stuck on the six-figure hamster wheel, watching retirement slip further down the road. There's another way. Get coaching courses and community at WealthyU.com. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing. Creating. Making moves. The move us all forward. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome to Atlanta, one of the most expensive housing markets in America. But rather than help out, Brian Kemp cashed in. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate. His net worth skyrocketed. And while Atlantans struggled to stay in their homes, Kemp gave $10,000 tax handouts to the richest Georgians and a nearly $700 million no-bid contract to his campaign donor, Brian Kickback Kemp making Georgia work for him, not you. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network. A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and you're watching Get Wealthy. And today we're learning how to get wealthy as entrepreneurs, getting access to capital, so that we can grow our business and build generational wealth. Catherine, you gave us a lot around mindset, certainly, but now I wanna talk about strategy. And I think what would be very uh, uh, insightful for our audience, and by the way, you need to buy, uh, you, you need to get Build the Jam thing by Catherine Fitty. Let's make sure we not only listen, but we support. 
But you said something diff- uh, something that really stood out to me, and what it was your first pitch. And so, you know, talk about strategy. And the, the pitch is so important if you're going to get startup capital. So I would love to you with, to share with the audience what that experience is, was like and what you learned from it. Yeah, you know, I had created this really successful blog called The Budget Fashionista. And so I was I was making real money. I was doing really well. And I entered into one of the early incubator programs in New York City. And it was about 45 people, um, four women and me. And I was I was not just the only little chocolate drop there. I was the only person who had any sort of like pan coloration to my skin. Um, and for me, I was used to that. I grew up in Minneapolis, so I was used to being the only black person. But what I wasn't used to was having people have no expectations of me. And that's what happened. Um, I got up to do my pitch. It was a beauty sort of tech company for black women. This was in 2009. Now in two- 2022, after success of Shea Moisture and others, we know that that's an amazing business. But in 2009, people didn't get it, right? And people meaning um, sort of the, the white male folks who had access to capital. So I got up and pitched into this group of maybe 150, 200, mostly white male investors. And it was an amazing pitch. I was actually told that. But you could see that they were desperately trying to figure out how to sort of undermine that fact. Um, They were shocked that I could speak, which was weird because I was a correspondent at that time on the Today Show. So I was speaking like every month to millions of people. And again, as I said, I'm from Minnesota. I know how to talk, right? So I'm like, why is that surprising to you? And so I gave the speech and I knew my numbers backwards and forwards because I knew that's how they kind of get us because we don't know our numbers sometimes. And that would be one of the pieces of advice I would say to founders of color, when you go on into pitch, they're going to challenge you and they're going to challenge you harder. Um, And so make sure you know your numbers, your customer acquisition costs, the lifetime value, the amount of, you know, possible monthly reoccurring revenue, all these things, know it backwards, forwards, behind, you know, cartwheels, all of it, know all of it because you're going to get questioned on it. And so I was really excited. You know, I knew my numbers, was excited to answer the questions. And the first question was not really a question. It was a statement. He said, I don't think you relate to other black women. This was a white guy who was telling me this in front of 150, 200 black or white investors. And he said, I don't think you can relate to other black women because you have an accountant. And I just don't think other black women would would be able to relate to that. And I did what most, you know, black folks do when we're put in that situation. You, you do this instant mental calculation because you know you can't pop off because you want to pop off. That's what you want to do, right? But you know you cannot because everyone's looking at you. You know if you pop off, again, we don't get to own our failure. If you pop off, it's like, well, black women just can't take the heat in tech. They just can't do it. You know, you're, you're like set up for this failure. And so, I mean, the first question I asked because I was curious, I was like, do tell, because I was like, maybe he grew up in Harlem. I live in the South Side of Chicago. Maybe he grew up around here. I don't know. Like, maybe he knows something about Black people. I don't know, even though I've been Black my entire life. Um, And it was so dismissive. And I later went to talk to the founder of the incubator, who's a white guy who's still around. And he sat me down and he said, look, you honestly know this business, you have this active customer base, you are known in this space, but I've never known a black woman to raise venture capital and I don't think you will be the first. So thank you. And it was like, thank you meaning you can go now. Um, And it was so dismissive. Uh, But for me, it didn't really matter what they said because I had a successful business going on with the budget fashionista. So what he said about that was irrelevant. Um, because I saw the revenue and I had the bank account and I knew what was coming in. So your sort of racist, sexist opinion didn't trump my bank account because my bank account is, is what it is. But it was really disheartening. And it, but it led me to start Digital Undivided, um, because, which is a social enterprise that I found um, that really works in creating a space where women win, particularly women of color win. 
Um, I, I don't think I would have started if I hadn't gone through that experience because I'm like, here I am, someone who is successful that you know, that built the company, and yet you dismiss me just as much as you would dismiss anybody else. And it's like, there's a, there is a structural problem here. There's an institutional problem here that is really difficult to solve. Um, and so, you know, going through that pitch and seeing someone like myself having to be questioned, or just, it's not even questioned, being discounted um, in that way, it spurred me to create something that directly addresses that. And as a result of that, we did Project Diane, which was the first report that really documented a lot of the inequities within venture capital and totally blew up the venture capital industry. <laughs> to this day, the, you know, I'm always surprised at the impact the report had. Um, but it came out of this frustration and the gaslighting of venture capital and my white male colleagues of like, oh, it's not really that bad. Um, to receive investment. I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to document just how bad it is because I need you to see just how bad it is. And the way I know how to do that is through research. And I'm a Yale-trained epidemiologist, and so I know how to do research. And that's what we did with Project Diane. Um, so a lot of good came out of that horrible experience. And I think as entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs of color, you're going to get challenged. That's a guarantee. And you're going to get challenged probably unfairly. That's a guarantee. Yeah, Catherine, you know what? That's why I wanted our audience to hear this experience, right? Because the, the reason it's so important is uh, oftentimes, you know, we have to keep our cool. But in so many instances, we are in a hostile environment, <laughs> right? And so you, if not, you know, what you... And, and what I love in your book is you talk about how you have to keep your cool because you don't want to ruin it for the other founder that's going to become behind you and, you know, maybe pitch to an investor. And because you kind of lost your cool or something, you ru ruined it for them. But but I, I would ask the question, because the other thing you do in your book is you really kind of explain, not kind of, you explain you know, if you're a startup and if you're not a startup, right? And so the, the, the other aspect that I wanted, I think is important, let's say you're lucky enough to get someone to invest in your business or agree to, how do you know, how do you decide if you are ready for this kind of capital or not, whether or not to turn the money down? Yeah, you know, that's a really good, question and there's a lot of people who have various thoughts about getting capital and when to. I always believe, particularly venture capital, which is a different type of capital, venture capital is high growth capital, it's high velocity, meaning it's capital that's there to fuel rapid growth. If you're creating a company in which you're not looking for rapid growth, meaning you want to create a local bakery, um, and you, you're not looking at doing 10,000 pies a year. You only want to do the 100 pies a year or the, you know, something smaller. Venture is not going to be the best for you. And the reason why it's not is you're going to be pushed and forced to scale rapidly and create rapidly, 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 because that's the only way that I get a return as a venture capitalist. So... If you're not in a high velocity business, meaning a business that you're not growing rapidly and has the possibility to grow rapidly, don't take venture funding. In many ways, I would say don't even take angel funding. Um, there are other cap ways to access capital. There's grants, there's um, small business loans, um, there's micro lending platforms like ACO and others. There is crowd equity. There's so many different ways in which you can access capital, but don't take venture capital, right? Um, that's really only when you have a high velocity, high growth company. That's good. That's good. So we, we've covered a lot of ground and I hope our audience is enjoying just your candor and the insight that you're giving us uh, so that we can, if we need it, get access to this capital. So when we come back, we're, the next part of the framework is execution 
And so I want to share with our viewers what they need to be what they need to do to be successful. Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Welcome to Atlanta, one of the most expensive housing markets in America. But rather than help out, Brian Kemp cashed in. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate. His net worth skyrocketed. And while Atlantans struggled to stay in their homes, Kemp gave $10,000 tax handouts to the richest Georgians and a nearly $700 million no-bid contract to his campaign donor. Brian kicked back Kemp, making Georgia work for him, not you. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and we certainly have been having a conversation about getting wealthy and getting wealthy through entrepreneurship. That is how real wealth has been built in this country. And so much of it is having access to capital, but not only, you know, not only uh, 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 monetary capital, social capital, and all the insight that Catherine Finney who is uh, the one of the partners in the Genius Fund and a general partner, founder of the Genius Fund and a general partner in the Greenhouse Fund. So, so Catherine, thanks so much for giving us just the insight around, you know, the mindset we, we need to have to be successful and some of the strategies we can use to fund our businesses. But the, the other question I have for you though, once a business is up and running, and profitable, you know, the way you define startup in the book is really you, you are starting out with an idea, you're going to, you want to grow fast and you're looking for an exit. Whereas the majority of black founders and black businesses specifically are maybe not startup. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so what do you do if you feel like, man, I have a proven concept and now I want to scale and put a tech component. How do you know when and if you should do that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really up to you, meaning deciding at what scale do you want to operate? Do you want to grow a business that serves a lot of people? Or do you want to grow a business that serves a localized group of people? And that is a question for you to determine. And once you determine that, the type of capital that you access is going to follow. These are certain types of capital that are best for those things. So, for example, um, a bank loan. It, it might be best as a bank loan if you have a single sort of brick and mortar location and you're only going to operate that and you don't want to grow or scale and that you want to not give up any equity within your business. Bank loans are great. However, if you're developing a website um, that is, uses a lot of technology and in order to get it off the ground, you're gonna have to hire a bunch of people and it's gonna be difficult to get a loan for it, then that's where venture comes in because venture is more patient capital. Where loans, you gotta pay them back each month and if you don't, they'll come and take everything. But for me, when I invest in you, I'm investing on a five-year horizon. I mean, I'm looking that it's gonna take me five years to get this return back. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I think can help you sort of figure that out. It, it, it's interesting, your own journey, uh, Catherine, uh, I, I didn't realize that you were, you know, you were way ahead of your time in terms of your budget fashionista and really growing that to seven, you know, beyond seven figures and exiting. And so I guess that's my other question. I think so often, and you define this in the book too, you know, uh, uh, exit, a startup really starting up to exit. And for many of our businesses being legacy buildings and wanting to go to the next le legacy, I guess the point, the question I want to ask is, how do you know uh, when, when, like if you built a business mm -hmm. and someone were to ask you to, to buy it, 
How do you understand valuation? Like when you sold your business and exited, how did you determine what the value, what it was worth? It's interesting because in the startup context, there's usually four reasons why people buy a company. It's, uh, and I call it the four T's. It's taxable income, meaning that you have quite a bit of revenue. Um, and it is easier for the company to buy you rather than create and work and build a sales team and so forth to get that same level of revenue. Um, the other one is technology, that you have some sort of technology or, or framework that it would be really expensive for them to like build themselves. Um, talent, maybe you or your team or the team that you've built is so exceptionally smart that it would be, again, it would take them a long time and a lot of money to build it. Um, and the last but not least is traffic, or that's community. You've built this large community or you have this large customer base that again, is cheaper, faster for whoever's buying you to buy you rather than to spend time building it themselves. And so that's a, once you understand those and you understand why people will buy you. In terms of when to sell, that's really, again, a question you have to ask yourself. And for me, I sold the budget fashion used to because it was at crossroads. I had scaled it as far as I could without taking any equity-based investments, like anyone only having ownership of the budget fashion used to. So I had a choice. I could sell it to a PE firm or I could take venture capital and, and really work and try to grow it. The problem with that is like, I didn't want to be the budget fashionista anymore. <laughs> and so, and both of those areas would have required me to come onto the company and stay. And I was like, I don't want to do that. And so as a result, the amount that I sold my company for was a little bit less than what it would have been if I had stayed or had been an employee there. Um, but it was my decision to sell and I wanted to sell. And so what I got from it was the same sort of um, the return I got from selling was the return that I needed. So as an entrepreneur, really think about where you're at in your life. If you have an offer to sell, um, look at what's going on in the market. There's a people use some, sometimes a multiple of what they call a beta. It's like earnings before interest and taxes. I feel like I'm saying that tax. Like it's a it's a long acronym. I might have missed one of the words in there. But they'll use a multiple of that. Sometimes they use a multiple of revenue. And it is very industry specific because some rep industries have a higher multiple, meaning people will buy you for you know 10 times your revenue versus other industries where people might only buy you for two times your revenue. So there's a lot of information on that online if anyone is in the in the process of thinking about selling their company and need to want to understand valuation. Um, I would also say this, make sure that you have good counsel good legal counsel who has worked on a merger acquisition and or a purchase before. I've seen this happen to many black entrepreneurs where they cut corners when it comes to lawyers and they pay for it deeply later on. You've given us, whoo. <laughs> I don't know about our audience, but you've given us so much information in this uh, episode. However, what I want folks to know is there is so much more in her book and I would get the audio book mm -hmm. and I would get the book because, you know, you the, the book is almost like a, uh, I don't know, a manual to navigate gating the the shown up streets of entrepreneurship <laughs> because that's what I felt like. She was taking me back to my upbringing, but really helping us to understand that you're not crazy, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, they do have an economic advantage, but we can bring our own advantage to the table to be successful as well. And so when we come back, it's our analyze, optimize and maximize segment. And what I want Catherine Finney to do for us is to just share with all of you what she hopes you will take away from her labor of love, her book, Build the Damn Thing. So don't come anywhere, don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. When we invest in ourselves, we're investing in what's next for all of us. Growing, creating, making moves to move us all forward. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. 
When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we are about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, wait to $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and I hope you have really enjoyed this episode with Katherine Finney, author of the book, Build the Damn Thing, because quite frankly, that's how wealth is built in America. Katherine, one of the things I would love for you to do for our viewers is to give them a sense of what you hope them to learn, you hope that they learn from your book. You know, I wrote this book for us. And I, what I hope they learn and readers learn is that we can build it, we have support, and that the universe is conspiring for our greatness. And I think we don't often hear that. Um, we, we know there are people who are conspiring against us, but know that the greater universe, um, those of us who are spiritual God, wants us to be great and wants us to build and wants us to be successful. And I'm hoping that from this book that people are inspired and also get the knowledge and the confidence to do exactly that. Excellent. Well, folks, when we come back, the three takeaways from today's show about how you can build your own business. Don't go anywhere, folks. We'll be right back. Welcome to Atlanta, one of the most expensive housing markets in America. But rather than help out, Brian Kemp cashed in. He made hundreds of thousands of dollars in real estate. His net worth skyrocketed. And while Atlantans struggled to stay in their homes, Kemp gave $10,000 tax handouts to the richest Georgians and a nearly $700 million no-bid contract to his campaign donor. Brian kicked back Kemp, making Georgia work for him, not you. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene. A white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. Blood and soil, you will not white people are losing their damn minds. As an angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we've seen shock. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. I'm 
Deborah Owens, and I hope you have been getting wealthy on this segment, on this episode of Get Wealthy, because it really was all about you learning what you need to do to get your fair share and fund your business. So here are the three takeaways from today's show. Know your worth and think bigger. Clearly, you've got an idea and you can build that dream. Secondly, teamwork makes the dream work and you need to make sure you're with the right folks and you have a team of advisors. And the truth is entrepreneurship, it's hard, but it's worth it. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach. So, so glad you joined us for this episode right here on the Black Star Network. When we invest in ourselves, we all shine. Together, we are black beyond measure. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 